Hello, do you have a letter of Mark to enter my residence? Yeah, uh, hey Rand, uh, it's your neighbor. Uh, just noticed that uh, you've been digging a large ditch between our property lines, and I don't think that's covered by any easements with the city. Wondering what's going on, buddy? A ditch is only a moat when it's not fully grown. Now, I'm building a moat because in the Articles of Confederation, they enumerated our right to put sea monsters that <laughs> demarcated our property between us and hip-hop gangs, jackbooted thugs, and Planned Parenthood. <laughs> Oh, well, I mean, I understand that totally, Rand, but, you know, my grandkids that come over here sometimes, I don't want them falling into a moat, especially if there's going to be sea monsters, and I really need to know more about that if I'm going to sign off on any of this. Well, uh, according to maps of the Orient, they have a new type of alligator over there, <laughs> the likes of which those of us in the West have not seen, but uh, your, 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 grand, your grandkids, they don't have a right not to be eaten. I have a right to have a moat. <laughs> You don't have a right to not enjoy my moat. Yeah, I'm not going to enjoy your moat, Rand. I'm going to need you to fill in these holes before someone gets hurt, please. The only thing that's getting hurt is the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> You've illegally entered my property and tried to enforce your personal preferences on my right to have uh, river dragons, uh, uh, tributary <laughs> creatures, an all variety of slimy, slimy uh, crustacean types that will prevent outsiders from entering my domicile and harming me. This is it. This is your last chance, Rand. I've been a good guy about this. I sent you a bunch of letters. You've got to re- fill this fucking hole. I consider myself a gentleman, but you've left me with no choice. I challenge you to a debate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How about your ass debates my fucking foot? How about that? Well, since neither of those can admit words, I fail to see how that is going to happen. I can see why you your your objection to the moat is so great because you can only understand force. Oh, oh, oh! This oh argument ab absurdum. Oh, of course ad hominem. Oh God! Oh God! Jesus! Oh no! You you, you hear a perma band from my residence? <laughs> Fighting Rand Paul. Rand Paul is the fighting the senator. Now, pain uh, don't hurt. It's not in the Constitution. <laughs> Mind over matter. If, it, if it's not in the Constitution, it doesn't matter. You're telling me I know Kung Fu. No, Rand. You just get your ass kicked all the time. <laughs> I like when you do it. He's just like, uh, if you had allowed me to dress like the Matrix twins, <laughs> then this maybe the fight would have turned differently. They have dreadlocks, but they're well, not only white gentlemen. <laughs> But albino, one could say. It makes you think. It makes you scared. It makes you excited. <laughs> um, so, out of every U.S. senator to get just laid out Rinse. in a fight, and just, just, just get demolished. demolished in a fight, Rand is definitely the funniest. Oh, absolutely. Like, I was thinking about this, like, Ted Cruz would be the most psychically satisfying yeah. for just have that awful nose just pushed into or his head. Tom Cotton's giraffe neck flying as he gets <laughs> fucking socked. Like there are people that probably deserve it more than him. Yeah. But yeah. Rand is easily the funniest. Oh yeah, just squawking about the NEP, NAP while they're stomping <laughs> on his head. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, he's like uh, it's uh, all things go back to Eminem. This is the scene in Eight Mile where he gets jumped by the free world, <laughs> and later he's on stage at a debate. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I did get jumped by all six six of you. Argument ad absurdums. I yeah. saw you Rand's... went to Cranbrook. That's a public school. <laughs> public schools are not as good as private schools. I saw Rand Paul speak at um, the Kentucky annual uh, gun day. Um, however, because it is Kentucky, it is actually biannual and it is a three day weekend. <laughs> I'm not joking, but they still call it Kentucky annual gun day. They just, it was just extremely popular, but he was like the keynote speaker, I guess. 
And he got on stage and literally no one gave a shit at all. Because these are like Kentucky gun people that just want to look at like a oh like a you know, a civil war fucking musket or some yeah. shit. Yeah. Like that they're nerds. Yeah. They're nerds and not the correct cut type of nerd. Mm-hmm. They're not constitution. Yeah, they're no, not yeah. constitution nerds. Yeah. They're just yeah. the Second Amendment like tattooed the, on like, their back. Yeah, guns for the same reason. Like the good reason, like guns. They look cool, and you're cool when you hold one, and no one can ever tell you what to do ever again. <laughs> I don't not know. The boring reason. I don't know how you come back from getting nearly killed. People have need to remember this. He got five ribs broken, including yeah. punctures that could have killed him by a fucking retired. What, what kind of doctor was he? He invented some oh, sort he was of an anesthesiologist. An anesthesiologist. Oh, the hardest he was a rival of... ophthalmologist. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a Yo, real fucking degree, by the way, motherfucker. That community is incredibly violent. He's like, People he's like talk. hold on, can you read this sign? He puts it up, and then it's just a fist going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the guy, a, a retired anesthesiologist who invented some sort of like back back pain vest that like helps you with lumbar support and he just nearly murders you in your own home well he has an amazing uh lumbar uh core area <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he could he speared him like goldberg That's probably part, he's like if it, if his neighbor was brian dawkins <laughs> and you give him a 20 yard running start like how many more ribs <laughs> would he break like it's just like Unreal that this could be done from a standing start. I mean, who's exactly as tall as him? It's like two five eight guys just squaring off. See, it's confusing because I would have thought that the unpasteurized milky drinks would have more calcium, but apparently less. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, uh, he needs. I mean, he's not the libertarian his dad is. His dad is drinking colloidal silver. <laughs> He probably has metallic ribs. You could never do that. <laughs> He's like yeah. Wolverine. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I really think it like it, it confirms everything I've ever felt about Rand Paul is that he's just never had respect from anyone ever no, in any situation. No, yeah, that's true. He literally like he said something to he said something like criticizing Trump uh, at the debate, and Trump was like. Why are you even here? And it like ended the it ended his campaign. It yeah. literally ended it. He is the Jeb Bush of libertarianism. Yeah. Like he is the failed son who's just gonna let the family heritage go to ruin by being just pathetic and charismaless. Oh. Oh, hello. Hello, listeners. You just, oh, you've just been oh, joining I'm us. Sorry. We didn't see you there. You've been joining us, just listening in on this conversation we've been having. We always hold XLR marks when we have our normal <laughs> conversation as friends. Well, we don't want to let any any gold go to waste. But before, before this conversation gets on too far, let's start the show. You know us, but sitting in for us this week, we've got David Roth. Hi. David, hello. You probably know David best as David from Piscataway. He's a regular call-in to the Mike <laughs> Francesa show. Started out as a regular call-in to Mike and the Mad Dog, but you stuck with it a- after Chris Russo left. <laughs> I made a choice and I've had no choice but to live with it ever since. Yeah. So, yeah, you're, you're an angry guy that calls in Sports Talk Radio, and you, you tweet on, on the side. I do. I mean, most of – I get a lot of the, the Islander stuff out of my system on the radio, so most of the stuff on Twitter has nothing to do with hockey at all, which is uh, to the benefit of all my followers. How much of a bummer is it that Christie is not going to get a radio show like I, they were talking about? I think he's – He's in for a, a life that's actually worse than that of a sports talk radio host, which is just like going out for a breakfast sandwich and getting fucking roasted every day by a different person. And then he's going to like call them a big shot and get back in his car. And it'll happen again three hours I love later. That, I love that every sandwich. time someone comes up to him, and they're like, you're a fucking piece of shit. You suck. No one respects you. You fucked up the state. He's like... Oh yeah, well look at you, Mister Important. Which yeah. <laughs> is amazing too. Being like, hey, oh, we see one governor in this conversation, <laughs> but he's like, uh, like, but he, like, yeah, but that's gonna be because it's, you know, you, you, there's zero governors in this conversation now. You're out of office. Yeah, he was. I had to listen to his radio show when I was for a piece. Like when he he did two days of like basically auditioning to get Mike Francesa's spot when Francesa retires, and he's like. A, you know, a polished enough talker and like authentically enough of an asshole that it wasn't really difficult for him. Like he did fairly well, but it was also it had this like purgatorial vibe because you're just waiting for someone to call in like 
saying they have a question about Aaron Judge, and then as soon as they get on with him, they're like, I hope that you sincerely choke to death on, like, some sort of cured meat. And he's like, oh, that's not a vest. Real nice. Real nice. Yeah. Like, yeah. He had nothing. He would just, like, escalate the shouting, which he, is a good sports radio move. He, he had all the – well, like, Trump betraying him took all the fight out of him because, like, you remember during the primary when when uh, Rand was like uh, – what about that hug you gave Obama? <laughs> and like Christie, if Trump like fired the shot in Duran's gut, Christie delivered the coup de gras because he was like, uh, he was like, I won't remember the hugs I gave on Nardola. <laughs> <laughs> and, be, and I guess there are enough primary voters who were like, yeah, that's right, Rand. He was in 9 11 <laughs> and it killed his campaign. Just as a uh, related to Christie, uh, I would like to admit there was an elections. Yesterday, rest assured, we will have full, full, election full saturation of Tuesday's election results with our voting wonk, Virgil, Texas. We're giving you full back-to-back coverage. However, I do got to say, I endorsed him on the show. Bo Deedle did not win God damn it. the New York City mayor's yeah. race. There are no heroes left in this world. But yeah. I do want to say, sort of similar to Christy, Bo tweeted this morning, Just th- this is so fucking good. He tweeted, good morning at Frank Morano. I lost last night, lost, capitalized, like the TV show. <laughs> he goes, good morning, Frank Morano. I lost last night, but I'm still a multimillionaire, and you're, Y-O-U-R, still a fat loser in the loser reform party. He, spoke, he spelled loser, loser twice. And also, well, oh, one you know, that's, one one <laughs> that's a classic cop insult. He's saying he has a loose pussy. <laughs> and also, what the frick happened to Walt? He was on the boat, and then he was gone. <laughs> there were no highlights to the Bodito mayoral campaign until that, but there's one tweet of him eating a sausage and pepper sandwich oh, yeah. in Midtown yeah. to, like, enrage the libs, <laughs> which he's, like, it was, just, like, directed. He added uh, de Blasio and was like, I bet you like this. You probably don't like that I'm eating the sandwich. <laughs> and just, it was just uh, eggs and peppers. Yeah. Nothing better. He was no, like, he, you, pro- he, you probably eat this with a fork, big No, he literally said that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, Bo. He was, I remember him from when I was a kid, and my dad would drive me to school listening to Imus, and Bo Deedle was their, uh, their racism correspondent. <laughs> when in back then, uh, he, was, he was recently off the force. His book, One Tough Cop, had not yet become a movie, which it really did. That's Sorry, Stephen Baldwin. Yeah. Baldwin. Stephen Baldwin and Tony LaPaglia, classic. That was what started their, uh, their career as an action duo. <laughs> uh, but he, um, yeah, he would just call in every now and then and like, talk about the things that black guys would do <laughs> yeah if it's like yeah. unreal it's so he basically he invented the breitbart black crime vertical before so, it's time yeah that's why like, he's a multimillionaire. he copyrighted really, that i think he's like, just a failed def jam comic he was trying out his material and it didn't land yeah it also it had the feeling of like every time you see those like every year some like just like rancid cop forum gets like screen grabbed and gets passed around online like just the shit that oh, they yeah, talk yeah. about in like yeah, Facebook yeah. groups, and it was basically that. Like it was being like, "I'm not getting out of my car. That's a Puerto Rican guy," <laughs> <laughs> and like that's, that's the joke, you know. Like, it's the whole thing. Sorry, he, he just has one. Uh, you know, his sort of concession tweet says, "I love this city." All caps. NYC is my home, and I've put my life on the line as a detective. I've created thousands of jobs, and will always be a true New Yorker. Wait, what? Whoa. How did he create thousands wait, wait, of did, jobs? Wait, like, wait, they had to hire more people for internal affairs investigations. <laughs> Well, like uh, fucking. Uh, I said coroners. the NY- yeah, coroners and uh, funeral home attendees. He yeah. runs a private detective agency, which is apparently the largest private detective agency on the Eastern Seaboard. If that's anything like the number of employees that he's ever had, I well, think it's just I mean, him. Private detectives have gone downhill because everyone's poly now, and you don't need to investigate. <laughs> <if> your wife, <laughs> wife is cheating on you, which is the only thing that private detectives do. He can. I'm just glad that he can go back to his first love, which is inspecting the Arby's meat. And making sure that it's all up to snuff at every store in the country. That would be yeah. He like goes into Arby's, but he just he has a flashback to like 1978, and he just beats the manager with a phone book. <laughs> <laughs> Is was, this genuine fillet? <laughs> that was what radicalized him. Was he lost his job to Ving Rhames? <laughs> he, re- <laughs> yeah, he realized the world was changing. Yeah. Listen up, Mister Pulp Fiction. You will not replace me. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Jews will not replace us. Okay. <laughs> yes. He was marching in Charlottesville. Oh, Jules will not replace us. 
Imagine if Marjay shows up with like an Under Armour polo on, but somehow it has like a really ludicrous pocket handkerchief like protruding like, from it. He has a pocket handkerchief just in his chest, probably. Yeah. I saw him. I saw him during the campaign. I, I went on. I was on Eastern Parkway at the West Indian Day Parade, and he was there right in front of me, just happenstance. And he was wearing like a salmon sports coat. It was in a really fashion forward look for him, and I actually kind of respected him. I, and I, that's why I voted for him. I respect dandy. him for all the stuff he did, but yeah. also, yeah. I, Oh, so that's the uh, NYC mayor's race in a nutshell. Bodito won't be our next de mayor, Blasio unfortunately. De Blasio continues to employ horrible people in his parks department. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just one big, just like patronage graft yeah, uh, warehouse. Yeah, just because someone has yeah. a podcast, you employ their brother. That's not right. Bodito will not be mayor of New York. He will be our next president. Oh yeah, yeah. This it's, is this is the like the loss like like Nixon had to lose once. Exactly. Propel, propel yeah. him and have this sort of chip on his shoulder yeah. to run for president yeah. against against Hillary Clinton in twenty twenty and then beat yeah, her. Twenty twenty, yeah, it's gonna be Bo Deedle and like Spyro the Dragon. He's <laughs> <laughs> like racist now. No, but Bo's gonna run on the Democratic ticket. Oh yeah. And yeah, he's yeah. gonna get the Democratic nomination. You'd be like, Yeah, I vote for Trump. Bada bing, bada do show. What do you want from me? <laughs> um Actually, this is a this is a segue into our, our, our topic for this week. Uh, we're going to talk about a book. We're talking about a oh. book. Oh Books. man! Oh, oh no, no! You, you you may roll your eyes. This is a book that is. It's the greatest book <laughs> ever it's, written. It's, it's roiling the democratic comment, commentariat with uh, its its startling revelations. Of course, I'm talking about hacks by Donner Brazil. The inside story of the break-ins and breakdowns that put From Donald Trump... From Hatchet Wounds books. <laughs> that put Donald <laughs> Trump in the White House. Now, this is, uh, you know, like the, the, the big... I guess the headline out of this is that Donna Brazil, longtime Democratic Party insider who was brought on to head up the DNC following Debbie Washing Machine Schultz's <laughs> uh, stepping down in August... That's always funny. ...of last me. year... Uh, now, it just says in this book and in a political article that the DNC did indeed rig the primary for Hillary Clinton, that their thumb was firmly on the scale for her, and the process was not fair to Bernie Sanders. And this has caused quite a bit of controversy. Now, this book uh, is a cynical attempt to both cash in and absolve herself of any blame for oh, absolutely. The, the loss of, the Demo- yeah. the, of this election. However... However this hoe is crazy. It is, she okay? She was always a little bit insane, and I feel like we should have picked up on it when she did the dance. Um, and you should definitely uh, the dance at the DNC yeah. this summer. This was was when everything was good. This is when she was in, in a good place. Um, and I think we're gonna we're gonna watch that so we can see Matt's reaction. Yeah, I've heard of this, but I haven't seen it before, so I'm I'm clicking right now on it. Granted, this is when things were going well for her. What the fuck? It's the man from another place dance from Twin Peaks, what? basically. What? Is this Twin Peaks? Yeah. She just, just, she just by his... finished yeah. her speech, by the way. Just stop And then by. that's how she left. That was sort of like a robot doing the nene while melting down at what, after being served with a logical contradiction. <laughs> I know why you nene, but I can't do it myself. <laughs> uh, wow. So this was her saying. So she was already kind of, you know, she's an, ex- an eccentric person. Yeah. Um, but she's fucking lost it. And it's she fabulous. Rules. She's she, fucking yeah, no, cool. I like her well, now. yeah, but I mean, who didn't go crazy after Trump won? Well, but Basically here's the thing. Everybody. Like yeah, I said, she is out to lunch. The, 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 she is out to lunch, and the book is a cynical attempt to cash in and absolve herself of any blame. However, her portrait of the DNC and the Democratic Party in this book is pretty incredible. And I have to say, it does actually absolve her of some of the blame. And most of it lands squarely with the Clinton campaign and Debbie Washing Machine Schultz. Okay. We have to start out just with the dedication. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The book starts out, this is, it's dedicated, it says, In loving member of my father, Lionel Brazil Sr., my beloved sister, Sheila Brazil, my fearless uncles, Nat, Floyd, and Douglas, Harlem's finest, my aunt Lucille, my friend and mentor, David Kaufman, my DNC colleague and patriot, Seth Rich, <laughs> and my beloved Pomeranian. Morning Pomer- until I join you. <laughs> and my beloved Pomeranian, Chip Joshua Marvin Brazil, in parentheses, booty wipes. I miss y'all. 
How many names does that dog have? It has Chip? four names, and it's dead, and she <laughs> dedicated the book to it. Chip Joshua Marvin Brazil. It's but, nickname Booty Wipes. Wait, yeah. Wait, were her so was the dog was the dog and Seth Rich killed by the same? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now you'll notice that she dedicates the book to Seth Rich as well. This book, uh, in addition to having some hilarious behind the scenes stories, is also funniest if you read it like her coded confession for having him killed. Yeah, I mean we've I've alluded to it earlier. Like a lot of crazy shit this year, huh? What if they really did fucking murk Seth Rich and it was the only thing the campaign didn't fuck up? <laughs> I just can't conceive of that. I, no, I mean, I could imagine, it up, I'm man. imagining it and it's like Robbie Mook with a blunderbuss <laughs> that he like fails to load at correctly and he just gets a bunch of soot in his face. Yeah, That's Robert, always been the funniest thing about any of the like the Clinton murder list thing is that these are guys like they whatever get elected as Democrats and somehow wind up getting rid of welfare. Like this is like every blooper every 45 minutes someone yeah. is like falling down a long flight of <laughs> stairs but somehow they also have like dozens of bodies on them and have never been held to account for it. Like it just does not I don't know like any of it. They would yeah they would fall, they would kill like Robbie Williams by accident. <laughs> They would, yeah, they would hire, like, whatever real-world equivalent of the Three Stooges to, like, drop a safe on a guy's head. They wouldn't do it right. They would contract it out. Well, she she mentions multiple times that when she started to learn what hacking was, which, by the way, apparently the people, like, the consultants and stuff she immediately hired to brief her on this were just those companies that, like, scare the shit out of old people during daytime TV and, like, be like, we could protect your identity Life for lock. 20 bucks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, the, those people. Because she narrates the whole thing like a John le Carre novel. And she thinks, she's not willing to say it, but she said, I wondered if the Russians had anything to do with his death. I'm not even kidding. She's, that's where she's at right now. But mentally. if they told her they hacked it, why would they just kill some guy who worked at the DNC? You know, you are trying to throw together a consistent narrative with a woman whose idea of reality is a moving target. Okay, so the, the book opens with an introduction called The Phone Call, which is all about how Hillary Clinton waited until February of 2017 to give her a personal phone call after the election. <laughs> which she is not <clears throat> mad about at She's all. She's not mad at all. She says, uh, she says here, um, uh, after that disastrous election day, I didn't want to think about politics or talk about it. And I guess that Hillary was feeling worse. You know, She had blown this chance and had let her sisters down. My heart went out to her. And then she just he says, he goes, in italics, I wanted to say... I have nothing but respect for you for being so brave and classy considering everything that went on. Then she goes on for the next couple pages to talk about uh, how everyone else called her, including uh, Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. Both picked <laughs> up the phone. Hillary did not. Uh, I'm glad your dog is dead. <laughs> <laughs> Marvin's a terrible name for any animal. <laughs> I don't care about your uncles. <laughs> and then when Hillary finally does call her, she says... Uh, this was chit chat, like I was talking to someone I didn't know. This is not, I can't wait to see you. Let's get together. You stepped up, and I really want to thank you for doing it. So the phone call didn't go uh, as much as she planned, but she did say, could she get, uh, she said she wanted to tell Hillary all these things. Like, could she uh, not forget the murder of Seth Rich? <laughs> She actually said that on yes. the phone call. Yes. Yeah. Holy shit. And she asked her for money, right? Yeah, yeah. She said, are you donating to... Uh, well, to be, fair, to be fair, that's what I say to both, everyone on the show when you guys call me. I'm like, don't forget Seth Rich, and can I have some money, please? <laughs> so she goes, as the call wrapped up, Hillary said she hoped I would be okay. That's when I almost lost it. Even if the party was starting to regain its footing, I was not okay. I had nothing left to return to. This campaign had tarnished my reputation, forced me to step down from CNN, and strained my relationships with colleagues and friends. <laughs> the hacking of the DNC by the Russians shook my world, depleted my energy, creating in me a fear so deep that now I had surveillance cameras on every door and window at my house. You guys, Donna is not okay. <laughs> I love the idea that the Russians were like, Donna Brazil is too competent. We she's gonna find out. We have to kill Donna Brazil. We have to kill booty wipes. <laughs> yeah, booty, wa booty wipes uh, possess compromot. We must Pomer neutralize. Pomeranian is famously intelligent dog. 
So, the, like, the, the book starts around, like, summer 2016, right? Like, right before, like, WikiLeaks release, releases all of the DNC emails. And Donna Brazil is a longtime Democratic Party operative. She's a CNN contributor. You know, things are going good for her. Then this hack, the, the, the WikiLeaks thing happens, and Debbie Washing Machine Schultz basically is like, I need to step aside. This is causing too much, too many problems. Well, it's not like she completely made that decision on her own. No, obviously not. It's not like she's like, you know what? I've really, uh, really defamed the campaign here. I'm, I'm very ashamed. Like, she was clearly pushed out. Well, Donna begins by saying, <clears throat> I had known Debbie for many years, and it pained me to hear critics talk about her behind her back. I was even more pained when I joined in that chorus. It was so... She's so bitchy sometimes. It's amazing. Like, it was really hard for me to point out how much you sucked. <laughs> so then, Why would you put me through that? She goes on for the rest of the book to describe her Debbie washing machine's many, many failures. So she is joining the chorus. So she goes... She writes here, The notion of being the party chair, even for a little while, did not appeal to me at all. Maybe it was just the mellowing that comes with age. I had a strong su- suspicion that my resistance to taking on this job was because of Kai, a little boy who had stolen my heart. I'm sorry, what? Uh, <laughs> this, is like, this is such a weird B-plot. It's so, such a throwaway so, plot. Is that another name for her dog? That like- <laughs> no, no. This is, Kai is an actual boy. She continues, Kai was born strong. I met and- him in the basement of Comet Ping Pong. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, when I first got this book, I got the the Kindle version, and I I did like the search feature and for pizza and gate and pizza gate and comet. She does not mention any of it in this book, unfortunately. That's why you it's need, suspicious. Yeah, really. that's why you need a Straussian reading. You got to get between yes. the lines, and you will find out that it's all a confession about pizza gate. Well. Speaking of, okay, let's talk about Kai then. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Kai was born strong and healthy late in May 2016. But, oh, the, uh, the but check this like out. Me. It says, uh, was born strong and healthy in May 2016, but the birth really tore up his birth mom, Mia. Okay. Jesus, she, all right. <laughs> she had to stay in the hospital for six weeks with a horrible infection that threatened her life. During that time, she and her wife, my best friend Betsy, asked me to care for the child. Now, here I was thinking, here's this girl who spends all of her life guarded. Don't want no more love. Don't want no more attachments. Don't want no I'm scrubs. Done, I'm done scrubs with that. I can't get no love Is this me. what she told Hillary the moment that Hillary picked up? <laughs> so, yeah. These lesbians gave me their baby, and I'm just like... That's just... great, Donna. Uh, you're great because you're good. <laughs> give, give Kyle my best. <laughs> So this is never explained. She's, by she's the spent, way, at no, all. no. She just says she spent seven weeks caring for uh, Kai, and that they bonded, and that she really. And just we don't wanted... understand why. Apparently, the birth mother was sick, but she the, the child has another mom. Yeah, yeah. Who's not? Who's just? Who's just her best well, she, friend? Yeah, but apparently, I don't know. Maybe she was I working too hard to, at her I job. I want you to do to my baby what you did to the DNC. <laughs> I don't even understand like these like. Like, it's a very confusing kind of power lesbian, you know, well, Hillary, I kind of understanding of family. Donna like, Bra- I became very attached to the baby. Yeah, Donna Brazil is like your, if you grew up like me or Will, she's your mom's friend who just makes you very uncomfortable for a reason you can't describe. She's very nice to you, but it just, you have a very weird feeling. How around, are your grades? Yeah, yeah. You can do better than that. And you're like, <laughs> I've met you twice. <laughs> <laughs> We have like beads that smell like the garden on you. What the <laughs> fuck? That's Donna Brazil. She uh, she talks about um, going into the hotel suite to sort of take the baton from Debbie and writes. Uh, she was not in tears, but it looked like she just stopped crying. <laughs> Dude, with look at the. I think that's just Debbie's bloodshot eyes. Yeah, no, she always she always looked like she just got out of a car wash. Yeah, car washing machine. She was Debbie Wasserman Schultz, like very toasted person. <laughs> she's, she's, she's like golden brown. Yeah, she like slept in a hot box setup. <laughs> yeah. Extra crispy DNC chair. Yeah. What's that Florida look? By the way, while while Will is doing his search, uh, when people in the DNC announce that they're pregnant, their friends say, "Oh, that's great. Is it going to be pepperoni or mushroom?" <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Holy shit. Uh, speak, speaking of, of food stuffs, one of the first things I listen, some of the names in this book are hilarious. So she goes, the problem I faced first was who is going to gavel in the convention. It was traditionally the role of the party chair to do so, but I didn't want to do that to Debbie. It would seem as though I was gloating in my new role, and that was so far from the truth. No it matter- would be so cruel to Debbie <laughs> if I pointed out how she's gone and I have her job now. And I just, I don't want to be mean like that. So she goes, no matter matter what she did or didn't do as chair, Debbie deserved a respectful exit. It would be cruel for me to get on stage and on national television just do the frug. <laughs> Donna Brazil is that bitch who's like, oh my God, you look so good in mascara. I can't even wear it because my eyelashes are too naturally thick and long. <laughs> Listen to this. At 4 p.m., oh no, just, I decided Stephanie Rawlings Blake, mayor of Baltimore and party secretary, who had been intimately involved Stephanie, in. Stephanie, you have too many names. <laughs> All of these people have too many names. <laughs> Stephanie Rawlings Blake, who had been intimately involved in planning the convention, would call it to order that afternoon. At 4 p.m., she did so, bringing the National Democratic Convention to order. She then turned the gavel over to Rep- Representative Marsha Fudge. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real man. This is not making this up. <laughs> Presenting the DNC by Richard Scarry. <laughs> she gets the gavel over to Representative Marcia Fudge. Like a fucking key and peel sketch. Yeah. What the fuck is going on with Democrat names? Is it like, did Donna Brazil name them? Was that part of the DNC chair's responsibility? Marcia Booty Wipes yeah. Fudge. <laughs> yeah, your name, your name is fucking uh, Felicia... G- Gargoyle plants. <laughs> in, in the next, <laughs> thank you, Donna. In literally the next chapter, Donna talks about one of her longtime closest personal friends, a person named a person named Minion Moore. <laughs> Mind palace. <laughs> she just literally thinks like a minion worked at the DMC. <laughs> he, he was a he was a real go getter in his overalls and yellow <laughs> turtle. <laughs> sometimes sometimes he would show up on Facebook and he'd uh, look disappointed with a caption like, "When it's Wednesday, it's not Friday. I want wine." <laughs> Is it spelled like minion? Like no, no. It, mi- minion is spelled uh, uh, M I N Y O N. Uh, oh, that's okay. how they spell it in Game of Thrones. <laughs> minion. Yeah. Uh, so this is in a chapter called. Uh, the, this is in a chapter called the Russians, the Russians, the Russians. And I just yeah. highlighted. Hell I yeah. highlighted th- this section here of Donna talking about the hackers, and like I said, probably told by some like DNC like LifeLock. IT person. She writes here, the hackers were not two 400-pound guys sitting alone in their bedrooms. They were sophisticated teams codenamed Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear <laughs> by CrowdStrike. Tinker, Tinker, <laughs> Taylor, Soldier Bear. <laughs> oh, my... The intel I'm says that her. intel says that there's a fancy bear on my trail. <laughs> this is like the DNC. So good. This it was Abe Simpson, her co. Her no, I mean her. Yeah. Her assembling these facts like they only kind of half make sense, and you don't understand why the baby's there at all. So. Yeah. What was the ba- what was the conclusion of the baby plot that she'd like? There's the no. It's just a loose end. <laughs> She's like, I was sorry to be leaving that baby that I had bonded with over the last few weeks, but it wasn't mine, and I had a job to do. <laughs> Tossed it over my shoulder, and my friend, my friend Cornelius uh, Vander Vandercom caught it. <laughs> That's not his name. I like, I don't know, his new name that I like better. In the uh, <laughs> my friend, How to Train a Dragon. <laughs> in the uh, in the next chapter, she sort of finally takes the reins of the DNC and finds out that they're completely fucked. Which is pretty funny. She finds out that there are two million dollars in debt, and that this is actually pretty. We spent seven million dollars on names, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were funneling money into the party from the campaign. It, 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 from it, the it's, state, it's, it's very, races. it's yeah. very scummy. Yeah, uh, it's super scummy, and uh, this is actually pretty amazing. 
uh, she had she had worked at the DNC like just five or six years earlier. So she was familiar with the, what their like operating budget would be. She comes in now and finds out that since she's left, their monthly operating rate had increased by about two million dollars. And this was in, almost entirely. This is like the actual part of like interesting news in this book is that Debbie had basically just brought in this enormous crop of consultants yep. to work for them that were just all graft in almost entirely. And actually, uh, excuse me, graft. Those PowerPoint presentations showing about how lacrosse grandmothers <laughs> in Loudoun County, Virginia, were going to be the difference in the election were crucial to she, them getting their asses. They I have were to say, the though, difference. She does talk about micro targeting and 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 disparagingly, and it's like weird because you're like, at some point, this woman was like competent, maybe not totally sane, but like she knows what's going on. Like she's not completely like flying by the seat of her pants, and she knows that shit is bullshit. Yeah, but then oh, yeah. one day, one day you, you're nor- you're relatively normal. You might be a little dramatic. You might you know in- a little eccentric. Yeah, you yeah, might yeah. you might wine o'clock might come earlier and earlier oh, in the day. Oh, for there's you. a lot of there's wine. A, oh, there's the a book. lot there's of wine so, o'clock. But, in this also, book. Johnny Walker Black. But That's then friendly bear hacks all your Grubhub orders and you just lose reality. You're just no longer able to trust anything. You're, you're, you're Gene Hackman at the end of the conversation. Yeah. Taking yeah. the walls apart and, and playing but saxophone. I want to be, I want to be like, before we get back into the, the book, cause there's a lot of funny stuff to come. I, I do want to just make clear what is actually being, what, what it, was going on with the DNC. I think Ryan Cooper did a very good, clear summary of exactly what, how how this is kind of corruption work and basically I'm, I'm reading from him here he says um she used state parties to essentially launder campaign contributions and gain decisive influence over data technology analytics research and communications operations with the hillary victory fund big donors could write a three hundred fifty three thousand four hundred dollar check theoretically split between 32 state parties each receiving ten thousand and the dnc which would supposedly only get thirty three thousand four hundred in reality though almost all the money would be quickly transfer it to the DNC, where Clinton would have at least a large say in how it was used, certainly at least to hire her own batch of consultants. Right. So meaning like everything that she had acute, well, like everything that she considered the, the Bernie people paranoid for, she actually kind of is honest about. And she's like, the Bernie people were saying that uh, the Hillary campaign was basically running the party even during the primaries. And she's like, and then they were like, she, yeah. she comes pretty clean about it. So she goes, uh, uh, this is a, I got into the office before noon on Sunday carrying a box of items I brought from home to make my office more personal. I had so much on my mind, I barely remember the drive there. When I turned onto <laughs> South Capitol Street, I started to cry, but not about the situation the party was in. This would be the first time I entered the building since Seth Rich was murdered on the streets of D.C. In, on July 10th, and seeing the building brought back grief about his death. And then she goes on and says, uh... I had just left Kai for the first time in six weeks to fly to the West Coast when I got the call that Seth had been gunned down. I started to cry when I heard the news, and I had a hard time holding the tears in for two days. I called his parents right away to express my grief. On that Sunday after the convention, when I drove into the parking lot at the DNC, I felt that loss again. This was another thing I wanted to do while I was chair. Pressure the mayor's office to find out who killed Seth Rich. This is what she was going to do as head of the DNC. Yeah, was pressure the DC mayor's office to find out who murdered Seth. Rich. So like the DC, like the Capitol Police were like, ah, we don't want to find out. See, <laughs> I, she was like, she calls them up and she's like, listen, I found a baby or some shit, and <laughs> the building made me sad. Could you like solve this murder? I know you guys don't like to solve murders. And the renegade cop comes into the captain's office and he goes, "You got to find that rich rich kid's murder. I got this Donna Brazil broad in my ear yeah. all the time. She now. won't shut up about the baby." Uh, also, when she took over uh, Debbie's office, she like called someone to ask what you know what she should do with the office, and the guy was like, "Paint it blue." Because apparently, Floridian that she was, Debbie Wasserman Schultz painted the entire office pink. The guy who, oh. said, the guy who said paint it blue is actually Terry McAuliffe, former oh, okay, head of the DNC, right. oh. Virginia governor. And Wasserman Schultz had also painted it pink for breast cancer surviving. Right. Uh, well, it because she likes another or, organization well, no, no, that no. grips everybody, Susan G. Komen. Yeah. Well, no, I, but it, it wasn't 
it wasn't said that it was for breast cancer. I, that's very possibly true. It's also entirely possible that like this is a weird inference that Donna Brazil just made. She's like, oh, it's because because she had tit cancer, <laughs> and it's like maybe she's just like a tacky fucking Miami asshole who paints things pink. This is like a dream sequence written by David Chase. Like, there's so much going on. Like, the room is like a deep metaphor, but true. David Chase is such a genius because in his narratives, he leaves loose ends untied up like they do in life, but in a like, kind of satisfying way. And that's what this book is. This is what David Chase stopped The Sopranos to do, to write Hacks by Donna Brazil. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, 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 Donna moving into, her new, into Debbie's office. So she goes, oh, no, moving into the new office. She goes, I found an empty office near Debbie's that had a window that looked right over the train tracks. I grew up next to the tracks, and the sound of a train passing is always a comfort to me. Choo, choo. Nothing she's, wrong with it. She's, one of, ours. Wrong she's with one of ours, I'm telling yeah. you. No, she is. I brought in my box from home and took out a few pictures of Kai, a, get, a few pictures of her friend's kid to put on her desk. <laughs> one of my dogs, Chip. Yeah, never R. explained <laughs> why the other non birth mother isn't taking care of this baby. Uh, photo of my dog, Chip, and a sage smudge stick. I sprinkled a little holy water on the chairs and the desk and said a prayer for healing and strength. The last thing I took out of my box was my bottle of Johnny Walker Black. Hell yeah. Political veterans always remember a campaign by the vice they had adopted before Election Day. Decades ago in one campaign, my vice was Johnny Walker. Before I left home that morning when I was looking around for things that would comfort me in this troubling assignment, I saw that bottle in my liquor cabinet. Seeing it felt like finding an old friend in a strange town. I took one of the glasses from Debbie bar to my new office by the railroad tracks but i decided it was not yet time for me to, and johnny to get reacquainted it's the same, so I bro- it's the same bottle it's like a 25 year old scotch <laughs> 25 year old blended scotch in your office Did like you- there there are two two trajectories for women you can either become a wine mom or a whiskey crone <laughs> I, I think she's more of like an ether rag mom <laughs> I, I think by the end, she's going to be a Jenkum mom. <laughs> I like, feel like she's just going up to an old AC unit and inhaling Freon. <laughs> well, Amber, like a lot of the book is like her dealing with like office bullshit and being like, I can't believe this job. Oh, my God. Another disaster. And then like being on a porch and like the next paragraph, she'll be like, I, I was on a porch in my house in Martha's Vineyard with my old friend, uh, Cressica Smunch, <laughs> 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 sipping a good, you know, I don't know, some cocktail or no, Prosecco. She was yeah, yeah, yeah. Prosecco. She loves Prosecco. And she's yeah. always like getting bad news, but she's always like on a porch in Martha's yeah, I Vineyard respect that. I'm a Prosecco little... Dude, hoe myself. She's like fucking Mags Bennett, <laughs> except totally incompetent and has a grip on nothing. All right. Uh, I want to do, do two quick anecdotes that uh, underscore Donna's sort of unprofessional office uh, culture. Oh, she would be terrible to work with. Uh, she's just sexually harassing people. <laughs> like So the, the first one comes... When she talks about the first time she goes to Clinton's campaign office in Brooklyn at one Pierre Point Plaza. Uh, security was tight. And she goes, when I was tiptoeing around the muffled Clinton headquarters, I thought of what my friend, Tony, uh, I'm going to pronounce this name, Kulo. <laughs> Tony, Some, Tony Coelho. Coelho? <laughs> if it's Paolo's brother, it's Coelho. <laughs> I'm just calling him Tony Coolho. <laughs> He goes, you used to ask me about my campaigns. That's my, that's my graffiti tag. <laughs> Tony Coolho yeah. uh, used to ask me about campaigns. He'd always ask, are the kids fucking? Are they having sex? Are they f- having fun? If not, let's create something to get that going, or otherwise we're not going to win. I didn't sen- sense much fun or fucking in Brooklyn. Okay, two things here. I like that her old ca- old Democratic campaign vet, Tony Coolho, was like, are the kids Wait, fucking? The- if they're not, let's make them. <laughs> He's the coolest of hoes. What I want to know is... How the fuck has there not been an entire InfoWars episode about the fact that this book contains the quote, are the kids fucking? Oh, wow. Okay, the, the, the are sec- the kids being fucked is, is the <laughs> subtext. The, the, uh, the second thing I, I want to talk about here is that this paragraph here, I think, was the one that inspired that epic tweet thread that we talked about on the last show this yeah. is about, about all the Hillary song. people being like, Everybody on that said we were fucking. We had no fun. Well, check this out. Here's my beautiful, strong office mate grinning over a you know a margarita. Oh, you don't yeah, think we're brunch photos? I yeah, saw that. Yeah, I saw yeah. this getting retweeted without context, and I was like, I, that looks nice. I guess. Like, it, it, no, it's what a they good looked omelet. like. What it looked like was all the stock photos of women eating salad and laughing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you say we weren't fucking. 
talking? Well, excuse me, but we were doing stage readings of Will and Grace scripts. <laughs> yeah, that, How does that, that not lead to fucking? That's my favorite thing is that it's like it shows that we truly go full circle because the first forum arguments were always about like, you're a virgin. No, you're a fucking virgin. Here's a picture of me with a girl, bitch. <laughs> and now like professional elite Democrats are like, oh, I'm not having sex. I actually fucking got married from the campaign. Here, here's my wife. I fuck her every <laughs> night in big bed. I'm cool. I had fun losing. Fuck you. <laughs> okay, uh, th- this is this is another uh, office uh, story offered by Donna. So, uh, Amber, do you remember what the setup for this? It's some conference call with the DNC people. Um, no, but I think that might have more to do with her storytelling abilities than, uh, my reading retention. Okay, so let's just dive in. She says, y'all are thinking I'm going to back down from this fight. No, I am not. We were just trying to preserve the DNC. The DNC is a wreck. We're tired of just plugging up the holes of this leaky party. Tom knows the building and he goes, blah, blah, blah. Of course, Brandon agreed with the men in the Brooklyn. Oh, this is a conflict between her and the Clinton campaign in Brooklyn. So he goes, he looked at me. She did not get along well with them and she hated all of their people. And it sounds like because they were not receptive to her being a complete asshole to them. This is the one guy. There's one dude that she hated who was like really junior that rolled his eyes. Is that Brandon? Yes. All right. Yeah. I I mean, who she, by the way, speaking of inappropriate, pulled aside. He's a black guy. Pulled aside at one point and says, "We need to have a black on black conversation." <laughs> I, Which is, I mean, like, like I, I don't, I don't know. Like, if you're a woman and you're sexually inappropriate with another woman, it's just like clearly considered. Like, there's already been like multiple situations recently where like female CEOs have been like you know, nabbed for, like, sexual harassment. Like, you know that that's not appropriate, and this is a person, like, clearly being is, inappropriate. Donna take but she o- thinks she can do it. Donna should take over management of the period underwear company. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my. She would be perfect for that. She would be perfect for that. So, uh, I'm just glad that someone is in the Democratic community is willing to have the guts to talk about black-on-black conversations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, by the way, I remember earlier in the book, uh, her friend Minion Moore tells her... <laughs> Stop her, saying that! <laughs> her, one of the things Minion tells her about the Brooklyn operation Banana. is that she said, Donna, you're not going to like them because you can't cuss at these kids. They'll take it too seriously. <laughs> Donna, too, Donna is, they're millennial Donna, snowflakes. Donna, yeah, Donna drops she's, a swear, yeah, yeah, and then she'll be like, "What the fuck?" She yeah, likes to drop she, the f bomb. She's your mom's saucy friend. And yeah, she like the point is like Donna may like she's been an abusive boss or whatever. She's right though; those people fucking suck. And like, yeah, they probably disrespect Donna because Donna told them to like I don't like do some fucking asshole stretch that she well, saw, saw on Facebook. Actually, but she's <laughs> right; they suck as people. And they're not fucking. They've never had sex. They're all the virgin from the meme. Everyone in Brooklyn wore transition lenses, but by Warby Parker. Donna's a fucking Chad. Respect Donna. <laughs> Actually, she does have an argument with Robbie Mook, where Robbie Mook, the ultimate like, virgin, yeah, the ultimate virgin, and where Mo- Robbie basically says they don't need to do X because they've already figured out that they have the exact percentage that they'd need to win and then donna makes the point the sort of old school political point well why don't it just like go the extra miles so you can go to bed really knowing that you have the margin and mook's like ah that is actually inefficient this is one thing <laughs> i actually do believe about her i think she has like better traditional political instincts oh yeah um but she's totally insane but of course that has to be on the graded on a curve because the democratic leadership strat campaign strategies have been just colossal idiots for generations now. Well, that's yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to say she's some kind of bastion of democracy within the Democratic Party. At one point, she talks about holding some kind of a press conference for upset voters in Florida. And then she's like, I wanted to make sure they felt they were being heard. And then she's like, but then they showed up and they started talking and it was really upsetting. And I went to the liquor store and bought $400 worth of liquor. And then the hotel tried to show it us down for serving liquor without a license. And it's like, Donna, what are you doing? <laughs> She ran Al Gore's campaign. Yes, is that right? Did. Yeah. Yeah, which is like, again, so this is like the, the steady hand that you call that <laughs> when you, yeah. you, you absolutely need to lose by a weird margin that's, where you somehow also win. Like, you somebody that knows. Holy shit. We know why Al Gore like, did softcore penetration with his wife on stage now. <laughs> that was so a Donna thing. <laughs> Donna, totally Donna literally must have told The kids him to need do. to be fucking. Yeah. Is the candidate fucking? Is he fucking on television? <laughs> Is he fucking on television yeah. on every channel on the networks and also PBS? So, uh, Al, can you wear a poet shirt and get stripped <laughs> open? 
So uh, back to the, uh, the this this conference call. So she goes, of course, Brendan agreed with the men in Brooklyn. He looked at me sternly as if I was annoying to him that I would try to take back control of the party as any chair would. Dolores was becoming furious. Oh, oh sorry, oh, no, sorry. Er, back, er, er, back, back, back. Slight digression. We need to explain who Dolores is. Amber? Okay, so, well. It's her last name, like, Hamburger Helper. <laughs> <laughs> never, never mind. Leave it in. Leave it in. <laughs> okay. I asked nicely about hiring Tom, this person who she'd worked with before. She tried to. She apparently tried to like hire staff that just like wasn't appropriate, and uh, she did. I think try to cut the fat on the consultants a lot, but she had her own dumb ideas. So she's trying to hire this guy, um, but that. Uh, Nice try had been ignored. I had gone around Robbie to get allies and pleading my case that hiring Tom was not just important to me. It was vital to Hillary's victory. A week into my job, I was beyond frustrated and my thoughts returned again and again to the idea that if I was going to get action, I needed to be so direct that no one would ever forget what I was asking. That's a part of my personality that I don't like anyone to see. A part of me (laughs) that is my daddy's girl. I call her Dolores, and she does not like it when she thinks people are not being straight with her. I don't want anyone to see Dolores, but I could feel her rising up inside of me as Brooklyn continued to waffle about Tom. That's so my, first of all, that's Dolores, my favorite anime, Dolores Rising. No, okay, first of all, like D- Donna has a, 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 a motherfucking share zone personality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, she's very much like, I like to say swears, and I sometimes have whiskey, and also I have an alternate personality that I've named, but I don't spell consistency, because sometimes it's Dolores with an E, and sometimes it's Dolores with an O. That's true. She does spell her alter ego's name differently at various points in this yeah. book. But well, she's Dolores probably never written it down before. <laughs> right. I was really interested in finding out which Democratic Party hack this was. Not, <laughs> I had no idea that it was like... It's Donna. That it was like the dark half version of Donna Brazil. It's like, <laughs> periodically shows goes out, speaks with a southern accent, and is prone to violence. <laughs> like, it's, the, it's, the, it's the Donna written by Richard Bachman. <laughs> Donna, is Dolores here right now? Can we, sp- can, we, can we speak to Dolores? Hacks 2, now featuring new unlockable character, Mecha Donna. <laughs> Donna isn't here right now, Mr. Dolores. Oh, Donna has reached Super Saiyan 3! <laughs> I mean, there is pay, no pay Donna. There is only Dolores. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kai can unlock Dolores. Oh, it's the, she can only the key become master. Dolores when she sees the baby. <laughs> the payoff. I've watched story a lot of anime. I know isn't, how this works. Isn't going to be as funny as as all of these digressions. But uh, Donna says Dolores is coming out, and Donna says, "You know." This does not feel like a negotiation to me. This feels like power and control. Gentlemen, let's just put our dicks out on the table and see who's got the bigger one. Because I know mine is bigger than yours. So put That's a, just literally put sexually them on the harassing table. your staff. Yeah. Okay. Robbie, Robbie, Robbie Mook like, consulted a data table and was like, what are the odds that my dick is bigger than Don's? Uh, <laughs> it's looking good for me. And he's literally pulling it out. And she's like, no, the, my, the fucking baby who lives in me is doing okay. a speech. <laughs> All right, guys, save up. Okay, this is this is now we're getting into the absolute gold in this book. Felix is so excited. I know. Listeners, <laughs> listeners, yes, yes. there is a whole chapter in this book about Hillary Clinton's fainting on 9-11. Oh, uh, behind There's the There's a chapter called The Russians, The Russians, The Russians, but then a whole chapter... The, the name of this chapter is called The Collapse. Oh, my God. God. As <laughs> Phil Cullen said, I've been waiting for this moment my whole life. <laughs> I just, Holy shit. Th- th- I've trained one, for this moment. <laughs> th- th- okay, this is really worth reading in depth. So I'm just going to begin <laughs> chapter 11, The Collapse. And again, not talking about the election, talking about Hillary Clinton's actual falling down on 9-11. Okay. Summer was over and Hillary looked tired. <laughs> I saw her again. Si- total bitch move. Just you look tired. <laughs> Summer was over, and Hillary looked tired. I saw her sitting in an armchair at the reception before she spoke at Cipriani Wall Street Restaurant in New York on the night of Friday, September 9th. We were there for the DNC's annual LGBT Leadership Council dinner. I immediately noticed her face was puffy and her skin looked pale and papery. Her eyes were glazed and she was looking off into the distance. She wasn't chatting with anyone and she didn't seem much like the vibrant Hillary I'd seen when we were fundraising in Provincetown and Martha's Vineyard a few weeks earlier. I pulled her aside her 
her top aide, Huma, Huma Abedin, to suggest that they needed to be taking better care of our nominee. I knew how hard Hillary had worked during the week she spent at Martha's Vineyard. There was no way that kind of schedule wouldn't run down a person, and Hillary was in her late 60s. Yet the people around her didn't seem to notice the toll it was taking on her. By the way, Donna has barely any contact with Hillary Clinton during this entire campaign, and you know she was just like going up to Huma and being like, you need to put her under the sun lamp for eight hours a day. She's like an iguana. <laughs> yeah. I found this uh, pussy washing crystal on Facebook, and Huma's like... Hmm. This should be sexually inappropriate behavior, but for some reason that just never rings a bell with me. <laughs> I just like the image of her in a chair, just looking glazed, yeah. like off that lean, just, yeah. like, just, just like completely melting into the chair, like off, just super slow mo. Purple. So she, I may not be grimace, but I'm <laughs> sipping on purple. Grip and sip. So goes, I was not the only one concerned about Hillary's health. Just a few days before, I'd gotten an unsolicited email from a doctor who believed that Hillary seemed run down. The doctor wanted me to pass along a message to Hillary that fame and glory were fleeting, but the body is your foundation and requires you to take care of it. She warned An unsolicited that- email <laughs> from Dr. From- Bronner himself. <laughs> <laughs> She warned that if Hillary didn't get some rest, she might be looking at worse health problems. I thanked the doctor for her concern, but I had not detected any evidence of Hillary's exhaustion myself until I saw her backstage. As I walked over to her, she grabbed the arms of the chair and brought herself standing, (laughs) but she was wobbly on her feet, steadily herself by placing her hands on a table. She laughed at herself. However, it was not the usual big hearty laugh that came from deep down in her diaphragm. But top- uh, yes, Hillary Clinton, <laughs> known for her hearty laugh. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> that that it, man the- with a bowl cut sure couldn't move that piano. It, <laughs> I love the triplicate of stooges. It wasn't one of Hillary's normal laughs, which sounded like... Uh, Stop her. It sounded <laughs> like the one that came out of the body of Jack Nicholson's Joker at the end of the Tim Burton Batman. <laughs> but she goes, how's every... But the, he said, uh, it wasn't her normal laugh, but a top of the throat laugh that turned into a rattled cough. <laughs> How is everything going, Donna? She asked. <laughs> it's going well, I said. I peeked out of the crowd in the ballroom. They all seem really excited to see you. Good, she said. <laughs> and then she started to cough again. <laughs> I oh told my God. <laughs> he goes, uh, so... Uh, Hillary was gracious in response. She thanked me for my concern and said that I should give the name of the acupuncturist to Huma. So... Uh, she goes, okay, so like, th- and then she talks about how this was the event where Hillary made the gaffe of talking about deplorables, the basket full of deplorables. Oh, yes. So someone didn't stick that shot of adrenaline in her heart before she went out there and she made a, uh, you know, as Minion wrote me in an email, this woman could not <laughs> seem to catch a break. As yeah. Minion told me on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> So I looked. I looked it up. Minion is like a real woman who works for the Democratic Party. But there's got to be like a hundred percent odds. Donna just like saw a minion, minion. It became a person, right? Like just, she has the, everything that you're like the Russia stuff and the security cameras. It seems like a very like that Facebook brain thing that happens where you believe literally everything yeah, that yeah. you see oh, in yeah. your feed. Oh, yeah. yeah, but the it, idea that yeah, if she's just like, like is like, Minion cut, is so loyal. Yeah, is there a cutout in the middle of the book where it offers you like seventy percent off Ray Bans? <laughs> So he goes, I was home on Sunday, September 11th, and aware that Hillary was scheduled to attend a morning memorial service at Ground Zero. It was a lazy morning with good weather, and I was hoping that Hillary was getting <laughs> oh, some rep shit. after the oh, service. Dude. Shots, shots, fired. shots, shots at Peter fire. down. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Oh, my God. Donna She's versus a killer. Stone Donna versus Dow. Oh, dude. Peter versus Donna outdoor summer hoop. Uh, That's what I'm saying. One, first to 11. Oh, you yeah. can take it. Yeah. And one mixtape. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's really like Robbie Mook running around the sidelines like, oh, baby. Every time, every time one of them crosses somebody over. Robbie Mook. Just getting stomped out by by uh, what's the goofy Philadelphia mascot that they had? The, the Philly second? fanatic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so she goes on. Just a bit before 10 a.m., I got an email from Jake Tapper's Sunday Show producer, wanting to know what I had heard about Hillary's health. 
Hillary had left the memorial service after only an hour, well before it was scheduled to conclude. The email said she fainted and was helped into a van leaving. Next, John King called and said the network had video of this. I knew how much this could damage Hillary. In August, Trump had returned again and again to the idea that Hillary lacks the physical and mental stamina to take on ISIS. It was not as if... (laughs) (laughs) So she goes... uh, He goes, uh, when the video aired, it was heartbreaking to watch. The camera angle was from behind, so I could not see her face. Her trip director, uh, Connolly Keir. (laughs) What? Oh, come on! Connolly Keir? Keir? That's a pub that Donna was in that day. These are all, like, they they started out as, like, sort of whimsical Richard (laughs) Scarry names. Marsha Fudge. (laughs) Marsha Fudge is delightful. uh, But now they're, like, Tom Clancy names. Uh was right at her side, her arm linked in Hillary's. When the door to her van opened, Hillary did not step forward to enter. She wobbled and fell backward a bit. (laughs) One of her legs gave way. I gasped, thinking that it had not been for Connolly's arm linked with hers, she might have hit the sidewalk. Several people rushed to her side to keep her upright, but they couldn't. I saw her foot come out of her shoe. She fell forward into the van as people scrambled to keep her upright enough to continue the story that she was just fine. Just a little stumble on the curb. Despite the efforts of the staff, it looked as if Hillary had fainted. This is brutal. This is really bad. But she goes, when the CNN tape aired, the reporter said Hillary had left the event early because she was overheated. What? (laughs) Who thought that up? They made her sound menopausal, which was unlikely in a woman at the age of 67. I emailed Brooklyn to express my opinion about what a stupid explanation that was. For a campaign that had a reputation for being closed off and sometimes less than truthful, this was a huge blunder. When reporters started calling to try to find out what was wrong after she left the memorial, the campaign had not returned their calls for an hour. When they did, they offered up this overheated nonsense that sounded like a lie. I was calling Minion and Charlie trying to figure out what I should say, jumping. Uh, 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 The fact that the press could get a straight explanation out of Hillary and her staff meant that they turned to the next person on their list, me. I emailed advice to the campaign. The media is going to run with the health narrative, so do not sit idly by. Uh, She goes on, uh, the next time we saw Hillary on television was that afternoon when cameras filmed her exiting her daughter Chelsea's apartment in Manhattan's Flatiron District. She was smiling and waving to the crowd of press that had gathered out in the street, her eyes hidden by dark glasses. She didn't look bad, but she was not giving them an answer about what had happened on the curbside at the memorial. Uh, She said some nonsense about how she was fine and it was a beautiful day in New York. Then she stopped to take a selfie with a little girl. Again, who had decided this was the best approach? So this is where she gets on to talk about in all this breakdown in messages. There's all these rumors going on. This is where she talks about she honestly started thinking about replacing Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine on the ticket. And a lot of Hillary people went ape shit over this because they thought like she was like plotting a coup or whatever. And she goes, my thoughts turn personal. Replacing the candidate was a bold move, but it was one that Hillary would never forgive me for. How could I do that to her? She had been my friend for decades. And then uh, she starts talking about how she starts getting all of these phone calls where like the highest levels of the Democratic Party were scrambling to meet because they literally thought Hillary Clinton was going to die. They'd have to replace her. <laughs> I, swear, would have I swear to God, this is in the book. And she starts getting phone calls from Martin O'Malley. Ah, literally fucking who literally warm. picks up the phone you're to just warm. be like, hi, Don, it's Martin. I'm just uh, just ran 5K. Yeah. God, I'm feeling good. <laughs> That's my Tommy Carcetti right there, baby. <laughs> yeah. That's my mayor. Fucking worm. <laughs> yeah. Fucking worm, Martin. I just love her bullshit, though. Like, this is the most passive aggressive woman. Like, the whole, like, I don't, how could I possibly do that? We are so close. I just want to use one more example <coughs> of, of her bitchiness. Uh, we put on I Am Kate, Caitlyn Jenner's reality television show, oh, yes. and laughed until our side hurts. We had to put it on pause to recover when Jenner got all these other trans people together and decided that the best thing they could do after they got all their nails done was to go out and ride dirt bikes. What woman wants to ride bikes after she gets her nails done? Is the we there? That's her and Dolores are the two people that were watching that show. <laughs> it's just like there's one paragraph about how, by the way, Caitlyn Jenner is not a woman. All right, this is, this is the last anecdote that I'm going to call the duck anecdote. And this, oh, so this one good. really does sum up the Hillary Clinton campaign. This is amazing. It begins like this. Evidently, someone in a Donald Duck costume kept showing up at Donald Trump's campaign rallies, calling him out for ducking the release of his taxes. Uh 
With all the noise and confusion and flat-out fear of this campaign, the duck did not surface to the level of my other concerns until one of my bosses at ABC emailed me. The message was titled, I hate to bother you on your time off, and it read, but Richard Bates of the Walt Disney Company is trying to reach you about the DNCs using Donald Duck. He is desperate. <laughs> then, <laughs> then the phone rang. It was Robin Spruill, the DC bureau chief from ABC News. Donna, you have got to stop using the duck, she said. What do you mean? Well, the Clinton campaign and the DNC are using Donald Duck at these Trump events, Robin said. No, we're not. I didn't approve that, I said. I looked online to see what she was referring to, and suddenly I was seeing the duck everywhere, in Los Angeles, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and even one going down the escalator in Trump Tower. Holding hands with a minion? <laughs> <laughs> Just as the other Donald had to announce his candidacy, this duck got around, and press reports said that Donald Duck was from the DNC, intending to follow Trump wherever he appeared to heckle him for not releasing his taxes. Again, she says, I sat on the porch at Glens looking out toward Kadama Bay. Again, she's always getting these bad news at her, like these really amazing beach houses she seems to be at. All I was snorting deck. Lambrusco in Miami. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so she goes, she calls this uh, Glenn Hutchins. So she goes, a duck, I said to Glenn. How the hell did a duck get past me? So I called Patrice at the office. She said she would have someone from the press office call me because they had been coordinating it. You mean we have a duck, I asked. We have a duck? Why do we have a duck? I hate the duck. When I was a kid, people used to call me Daffy because my name was Donna. I didn't want no damn duck. And now Richard Bates, the ABC vice president of government affairs, is calling me. I called the D.C. office again. Kill the damn duck, I said. Kill the fucking duck, goddammit. Why are you worrying about the duck? I hate the duck. The idea that... She couldn't scream childhood trauma. <laughs> yeah. So she goes, uh, the idea that the campaign, and as far as I knew, not the DNC, was paying someone to follow Donald Trump around in a duck costume struck me as the opposite of what we should be doing to keep the focus on Hillary's strengths as a candidate. So... Then he goes back to this Brandon guy. Brandon said this was no problem. The campaign and DNC lawyers had signed off on it. And besides, we had not heard anything from Disney. The reason I was emailing was because I had heard from Disney. So they're violating copyright with the Donald Duck stunt. Yeah, literally the most litigious company in the world. So she goes, I'm slow to anger, very slow. But once I'm angry, get out of Dolores' way. <laughs> I called Mark Elias, the lawyer for the Hillary campaign, and told him that I had heard from ABC and Disney about the duck, and he had to kill it. The duck is the intellectual property of Disney. They could sue us, okay? Do you want that story out there? Hillary's about to go to California to raise money, and she's going to see Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, who is holding the fundraiser, and this is coming from him. What do you want to do? Have him cancel the fundraiser? I know you all want that money, so get rid of the fucking duck. Donna, this was Hillary's decision to use the duck, he said. <laughs> oh, man. He explained a close friend had suggested it to Hillary, and she thought it was a great idea. Uh. Apparently, someone wanted to use Uncle Sam, but Hillary's friend vetoed that, saying a duck was a lot funnier. Okay, who was Hillary's friend? <laughs> we have to... Okay, so it was the friend Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein, <laughs> King Salman... Uh, or like wh who? Who I, was Hillary's yeah, I friend? I want to know. It had yeah. to have just been actually Hillary because she just has such terrible judgment. Yeah, no, that sounds like a total Hillary that's move. A, that's she's, a Hillary she's, move. She's, what if she's we use Donald Duck? She's offloading onto somebody else the responsibility, but it was clearly her idea. Well, we don't have to wonder, and I actually found this out independently, who was in the duck costume, uh, Lena Dunham. Little known what? fact. No. No, that's a joke. Oh. Uh, <laughs> obviously. You never know, though. You never know. I, you guys that. actually thought Lena Dunham yes. was in the yes. duck. Yes. Yes. yes, I think she would have. Had she been asked, she asked would have her, done yeah, it. she would have done it. But only if she could actually Donald Duck it and be naked from the waist below. <laughs> I was going to say, I think we would not. It wouldn't have been kept secret. But the idea of, like, yeah, sure, whatever. I mean, like, everything that you just described, if that is true, like, sure, fuck then it. Then yeah. why not? Why not? Sure. Yeah. Like, and she's wearing a bomb vest, whatever. I don't know. Like, just add whatever you want to the story. It can't be weirder. Oh, yeah, that's, that's was, Hillary's judgment right there. It was Hillary's idea. Amazing. It was Hillary a Dexter Lawnmower's idea. <laughs> she, <laughs> she took Holy it to the next shit. level. <laughs> what a oh. fucking. So, anyway, this Mook is the greatest political uh, memoir Epstein. ever written. Yeah, this is like up there with Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail 72 in terms of like a book that it's if you really want to read to like understand our political zeitgeist and like our culture that we live in and why everything is so weird and fucked up. 
read a book written by an actual crazy person yeah. about politics. She's like Hunter S. Thompson in that regard. Donna Brazil has only it's, it, she's in the best mindset right now too for this book because she's only recently left the cult and she still loves the fearless leader she just thinks things have gotten a little out of hand however some of the people still in the cult are really so mad at donna so mad that they're writing <laughs> open letters on medium to her <laughs> And it's like has 30 These aren't randos either. Including Huma. Yeah, Huma signed it. Uh, Palmieri signed it. Who, Palmieri, who she called a bitch in this book, by Ooh. the way. I just want to read the first paragraph oh, from this Medium post. I, lo- I love that it has de- like, it's, they've devolved into Medium post. Though. This is Jesse Ferguson's Medium post. Jesse Farrar. <laughs> yeah, Jesse Farrar's <laughs> Medium post. It says, open letter from Hillary for America 2016 team. We were shocked to learn the news that Donna Brazil actively considered overturning the will of the Democratic voters by attempting to replace Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine as the Democratic presidential and vice presidential nominees. By the way, has anyone thought of Tim Kaine since nope. 2016? Yeah, I like... I'm, Real inspired choice there. Excuse me, I read... Every day, I read one page from... Tim Kaine is your cool stepdad. <laughs> remember that book? Yeah. Does anyone remember no. that? No. What? David, you don't remember this. I feel like I should. It's, it's... Some, some content gargoyle. Yeah, I'm not, after he was declared the candidate. There was, um, it's ringing some bells, yeah. but also like. They none put of out this. a quickie ebook called Tim Kaine is your cool stepdad or something like that. It was maybe not cool, but like Tim Kaine is your stepdad. And it was like 20 pages of Kim Kaine barbecues and asked you how your day was. And, Things like that. Uh, Picks you up from your soccer match. Okay. This is all. It's, uh, I, I don't, so I still need that. So I don't know what you guys are talking. I feel like about. I'm I mean, embarrassed by it for the my first time. Stepdad but I'm sure was I'm anti-abortion, so it does work. <laughs> <laughs> Miyamo Tim Kain. Uh I just want to say, like, no, I need this to re- is this is the difference between Donna's strong spirit and their weak spirit. Donna doesn't have to look at another person and invent some fictional role they have in their life. Like she doesn't have to look at an existing guy and go, oh, "Please be my father." Like these no, she creates do. new people yeah. within herself. Yes, she's doing like yeah, she's reproducing, like uh, just what's the term when like a amoeba creates two amoebas? She's what like, like self reproduction? Yeah, she's, <laughs> I was just reproducing asexually. Parthenogenic reproduction. Yeah, 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 wow. yeah. Ooh, okay, there we go. Good job. <laughs> oh cool. damn! Uh, you should read the top highlight. For no, this no, no. The, 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 I need to read the top highlight because okay. this is the. Okay, sorry, it, sorry. It just so because. It is particularly troubling and puzzling that she would seemingly buy into false Russian-fueled propaganda spread by both the Russians and our opponent about our candidate's health. What what fucking everyone saw it, it, you asshole! You fucking asshole! Everyone saw it! Is the idea now that there was a Russian guy in a fucking hedge with a (laughs) blowgun who shot her with a poison dart? Also, I really resent the insinuation the insinuation that Donna is insufficiently vigilant against the Russians. She hates the Russians. Yeah, Donna's gonna fucking catch them. When this Rush like the only way Mueller is gonna get an indictment on anyone above Carter Page is if he recruits Donna. Uh, so yeah, that was a uh, Donna Brazil's book. I, you guys, I, you guys. Honestly, amazing. It was worth buying it. Yeah, yeah. Donna Brazil yeah, fucking rules. She rocks. I'll, tell she she I'll tell you how much she rules. She I'll tell you how much she rules. She made a new friend today. Oh, I what? No, that wasn't today. That wasn't what? today. That's an old photo. What? He, no, how? he talked. He tweeted about. He it He tweeted today. about it today. He tweeted it today, but the, she took another picture today where she's wearing something different. Just, just. Oh. just I don't care. He posted it today. Shut up! It's ruining everything. So this is the tweet. What? In New York City, I ran into Donna Brazil and talked about her book. See, it has to be new because she's got on the book He's tour. He's a liar. He's a liar. In New York City, ran into Donna Brazil and talked about her book. Even though our political views are polar opposite, we had a great conversation. Complimented her on her courage to out the DNC and hashtag crooked Hillary. Say what you want. More damage should tell the truth. Sheriff David A. Clark. <laughs> I was going to say Roger Stone. Yeah, that's but, the Roger yeah. Stone move, but he's banned from Twitter. Unfair. Okay, yeah. yeah. I think well, Roger Stone, that was an unfair Sheriff banning. David Clark. I'm say that so right I think this is, her, this is her next step. She will end up on the alt-right, and that's going to rule. Oh Dolores God, is going to understand about I skull shapes. Wait. Yeah, I mean they're bitchy too. Like yeah. they, they, the tea is very hot. Yeah, on Richard the Spencer is like the biggest gossip queen. Oh, really totally. Yeah. Uh, but we. I mean, we can do for Donna what we've done for like many young teens, where we see them going towards the alt right, and we 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 need to give Donna irony. We need guys. 
You guys want to go? Donna's in New She's York. already got the display name game down with Marsha Fudge and Minion Moore <laughs> and whatnot. Dude, she uh, could be in my irony. Idea. Donna on our show, Donna going on episode one. <laughs> Donna on Come Town. We, let's Donna it. Brazil, go on Come Town. She would go on Come Town. She would have a great time. She would kill it on episode one. She could be Debbie Wasser, Washing Machine Schultz <laughs> on episode one. She could do art. She can do reading series. She can do what happened with us. That would roll. We need to say Donna, her. come on, Chapa. Donna, I'm gonna say it. Donna, Nobody we, else say it to her. I'm saying it to yeah, you now. No Don't do that, that fucking joke. Stop doing it. it Stop sucks. doing it. It's lame. But we love unless Donna. I do it, Donna fucking protect rocks. Donna. Protect yeah, Donna. protect Donna. Okay. She she has a mo- she's at a crossroads. We can bring her to the light. Yeah, if not even for, it's not even we're not even doing a cynical political thing where we want some political achievement. No, we None just like her. We just think she's cool. She's cool. <laughs> <laughs> she spent thousands of dollars on delegates and Johnny Walker Black cops. <laughs> Uh, that, uh, that's that, that's the perfect way to wrap up a podcast. Every, epi- every, last every time, few episodes every have time, with Eric Paddock. Yeah, every time, just wrap it up with Eric Paddock. Yeah. All right, guys, uh, no, but don't reply to people with "Go on job" anymore. Just say "sushi comped." <laughs> Anyone you want to like bother, don't fight our battles for us. But if you really want to bother somebody, say "sushi comped." That's my advice to the fans. Don't well, say anything. There else. we go. I'd like to thank David Roth for sitting in this week. Thank you for having me. Please come back. Pleasure. Sometime yeah, soon, I, I can't believe it took us this long to get you. On I know. The, on I'm the happy pod, to do dude. it. I was like surprised that it wasn't like I'm happy not to have talked about football at all for the entire time I was here. But um, yeah, it's good not to do a sports thing. Thank you for having me. Can you come back on this weekend and talk about how the dang NFL players need to stand up for? Our I anthem? would yeah. love to. Yeah, do the most upsetting reading series <laughs> in the history with that fucking <laughs> political piece. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, where the guy at the end says. Uh, uh, he likes NWA's second album better. <laughs> That's you a, know, with this title yeah, backwards, yeah. actually. We got a little reference yeah. there for you guys. Uh, anyway, till next time, guys. Bye. 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 Thanks.